Okay. Um, I guess the audio level is okay, I hope. Nice like this for me at least because I don't have to speak too loudly. Um, sort of mostly over COVID, but I still have a little bit of a cough, so apologies in advance. I'll try to kind of shield the microphone if I can. But uh, yeah, I suppose it's good for us to get started now. We're running a little bit behind in part because uh, I was not quite fully ready to do all the technology things this morning, so sorry for that. But um, the way that we're normally going to do things to kind of get started in class here will be that we will have these questions just at the beginning of the time where you can let us know how things went the week before and uh, if you had any kind of problems, things that you might want to raise here so that we can, uh, we can go through those. But the first question here is basically just about what people learned during the, the first week and of course you all can can read this just as well as I can, but essentially we just got a little bit of our very first taste of doing things in Python. And uh, <clears throat> for those of you who read through the good coding practice, you may have read something about good and bad variable names. That's a good thing to look through if you haven't. But, um, you know, we're kind of just getting into the course environment, figuring out how things work in general. And from here forward, we're going to be doing more and more in terms of actually coding in Python. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's more or less what was going on during the first week, getting into the very basic things here. And uh, in terms of problems and things that I see listed here, not too many, uh, maybe some issues about where to upload your code on GitHub. So this will be something that uh, may be occasionally cause some confusion because <laughs> uh, we do have things like exercises in the course where we're going to give you a sort of starting notebook that you can work on and sometimes it's a little bit confusing uh, in terms of where to uh, save your changes. So for example here, this is the exercise number two um, notebook and maybe I'll make that just a tiny bit bigger. Uh, this is the repository on GitHub for exercise number two, and there's a notebook file in here called exercise2.ipynd. This is the copy that is used to create your copy of the exercise in your personal GitHub space. So when you click the button like instructed on the course webpage to create your copy of the exercise, it takes this template here, which is basically the version of the exercise that we would like you to fill in and makes a copy of it in your um, GitHub space where it is then private in terms of the visibility so that not everyone can see your answers, whereas this is a public version of the document. Um, sometimes I think because it looks almost identical when you come to the page and look at it, uh, here you can see that the name of the exercise just ends in exercise-2 and doesn't have anything after that. Your personal copy will always have your GitHub username after the name of the exercise. So if you're having confusion about where to store things, don't worry, you'll, you'll figure this out as we go along. But uh, for instance, if you tried to make changes to this version of the exercise, when you try to save them on GitHub, it would tell you that you can't do that and basically that you don't have permission to be able to modify this copy of the exercise. For your own personal copy, of course, you have the permission to make any changes that, that you might need to make. So uh, maybe when we come back at the end to talking about exercise number two, I can just show you uh, as a reminder how to tell the difference between the kind of master copy and your personal copy of, uh, of the exercise. Otherwise, uh, most of the time what you're going to be doing here is you'll, you'll take something where we already give you a notebook file and you're just saving your changes to that file. So there won't be a lot of like dragging and dropping files from your, your computer to, uh, to GitHub, but rather we'll introduce today how to save changes to the files that you, you're working with uh, directly inside the Jupyter notebook uh, or Jupyter lab environment. So, uh, so we'll come back to, um, to this issue about where to save things on GitHub when we get into the 
next part of, well, I guess the end of the class today when we talk about exercise number two. Otherwise, I don't see any major causes for concern here, and we have plenty to cover today, so maybe it's a good thing if we move on from here. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is just maybe open up the current version of the course page, <clears throat> which should now hopefully have exercise number two, or sorry, lesson number two visible for you. And uh, if we click on the lesson overview, we get some idea of what we're going to be looking at today. And basically what we're going to do is look a little bit at uh, converting between different data types. Then we'll talk about how to uh, store values in something called a list in Python. And uh, we'll talk about what, what, how, you, how you set up a list, how you use it, how you access values that are part of a list in Python. And then we're going to talk a bit about uh, version control today, which is really what GitHub is all about. So we'll get into some details about uh, why we're using GitHub, what, what the purpose of Git itself is, and things like that. And, uh, and yeah, this is not supposed to be visible, but uh, those are last year's lesson videos. Um, I guess before we go there, we mentioned last week, or I think I mentioned last week, we were having the problem with this CSC notebooks system, and it wasn't working properly. Um, that is the preferred environment for you to work on things in the course, and as it turns out, we managed to fix the problem with the environment last week. So now we're able to use the CSC notebooks, but you probably need to know how to do that. So um, the place we're going to start actually today is back in lesson one in the course environment. And in here, in this third section about cloud computing environments, there was some stuff about Binder, which I hope you were able to use Binder at least a little bit last week. But if you scroll down below the Binder stuff, there was this thing about the CSC notebooks that had this red box, like, don't use this right now. Uh, these instructions aren't up to date. Well, it's now working, and it should be the case that everyone who has a universe, like Finnish University uh, login credentials should be able to use our CSC notebook system, but you have to set a couple things up the first time. So I thought maybe we could start today with going through how to connect to the CSC notebooks because that's where you're going to be working. And, uh, and unlike Binder, it doesn't die after 10 minutes of inactivity. So um, it's, it's useful that we can launch it and open it up now. And even if we don't come back to doing something in there for, for 15 or 20 minutes, it's not a big deal. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, to start, the address is notebooks.csc.fi. So you can click to, uh, to open up a link to the CSC Notebooks system, and you'll get a web page that looks like this. And uh, what we're going to do is click the Login button on the left side. I think their system is now even more intuitive than it was, um, which, is, which is a good thing. should make this pretty easy. But when you click the Login button, you're going to most likely get prompted for how you want to authenticate. And for us, we want to use this Hakka authentication, um, which will allow you to use your university login credentials to connect to the CSC Notebooks system. Um, so again, it's notebooks.csc.fi is the web page. And when you go there, you click the login button, and then you're going to want to click Hakka for how you want to authenticate. When you do that, uh, the first time you do it, you'll probably be prompted for which university you have an affiliation with. Uh, you can, of course, choose that yourself, um, you know, whatever makes the most sense. And uh, I've already done this, so of course it takes me to the login for University of Helsinki where I can put in my information, if I can remember my password. Let's see if I got it right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it should allow you to log in. If anyone's having trouble logging in, please maybe raise your hand or let me know. Uh, I'm going to do one other quick thing here, which is 
leave the GeoPython 2022 workspace for a second, because this should be basically what you get when you log into the page. So I hope everyone's seeing this kind of list of applications. It starts with introduction to Python, introduction to R. Everyone's seeing that? Who's tried to log in? How about if you're not seeing that, you can raise your hand, because I can't uh, see your screen so easily, obviously. OK. So uh, what we have to do at this point is this, uh, when you log into the first time to the CSC notebooks, you see only their kind of default available notebooks for anyone who wants to use the system. So they have like these kind of self-paced courses where if you want to learn more about Python, you could, for instance, follow their introduction to Python course. Uh, again, they work in Jupyter just like us. But we've also set up our own thing, and in order to connect to that, you need to join the workspace by clicking the, the little key icon and join workspace button up in the top right. It pops up a thing here that asks you for a join code, and that is given on the course web page here. Uh, so I'll just copy it and paste it because I think you can probably... I don't know if you can read that, but <clears throat> it's geo and then some letters and numbers after that. Easiest thing is probably just to go to the course page and copy and paste it. But what this does is it then allows you to have access to our GeoPython 2022 um, setup inside the CSC notebooks, which is where you're going to be working on the lessons and, and exercises uh, alike. So once you've entered that join code, you can hit the plus button. And you should hopefully then see that down in my workspaces, there's now GeoPython 2022, which means you're all set. And you can basically close the box here for joining workspaces. And uh, you should then also see at the top of the list of the workspaces, GeoPython 2022. <coughs> So the next step then for us is to actually fire this thing up the first time. And uh, intuitively enough, it's the kind of power looking button over here on the right side that will start a session. Um, <clears throat> we haven't load tested this yet with everybody starting a session at once, so we'll see how this goes. Hopefully there's not any, uh, any lag, but it should be the case that we have enough in terms of capacity on the CSC's platform that we should be able to to launch 100 of these at a time and everything should work. But you can click the start session button, you'll see this uh, thing start spinning. It, it tries to open up a pop-up window, so if you, your browser might block that, uh, you can check. If you don't see this window that comes up that looks like this kind of progress bar at the top, uh, it probably means that the, the pop-up was blocked and uh, you can just, I don't know, click wherever it is on, on your browser to uh, to allow it to display that, but um, this basically will <coughs> put you in line to have a cloud computer that's available for your use. And uh, it should again be the case that all the resources that we need are available, but it may take a moment to launch. For instance, when I tested this at home, I was able to get this thing to launch in like 15 seconds, but right now it seems to be waiting here at allocating resources. Uh, a bit longer than it did before, and let's hope that this, uh, that this works as expected. <coughs> so for instance, now it seems like it finally did allocate something for me and very quickly then took me here to what should hopefully be starting to look familiar, which is our Jupyter Lab uh, environment. And I'll make that again just a little bit bigger. So. Um, I'm going to just walk around the room for just a second, make sure that everybody is kind of not having any major issues before we continue, because uh, our next step is also a useful thing that everyone can kind of do together. So if you're having problems, I'll come and uh, give you a hand here real quick, and then we'll continue. Our next task is uh, something that We've not had to do previously in the CSC Notebooks system, but we have to do uh, here with the way, <coughs> way that things are configured now. 
which is to uh, make it so that you can see the lesson notebooks for the course so that you'll be able to do things as we go through them uh, during class. And uh, this is, again, this is something I think we only need to do one time, so uh, you can just kind of maybe follow along this time and not worry too much. We're going to be using Git and some stuff about Git inside the CSC notebooks to do this, but we're going to talk about what, what is happening and how Git works uh, later in class today. So I'm not going to explain exactly how things are working right now. We're just going to copy some things and get ourselves set up so that you can follow the lesson for today. And, uh, and then we'll go back and talk about how Git works later on. But hopefully you should all see that you have some kind of Jupyter environment here and you've got two folders visible. One called Shared, which is a place where we could, uh, as, as teachers, put files for you to, to use and things like that. It kind of works for our purposes, but the problem is that if you make any changes inside the shared directory, uh, they can't be saved. So it's not kind of a great place for us to like distribute the lesson notebooks for the lessons because, of course, as soon as you close your, uh, your session here, you would lose any changes that you had. But there's also this My Work folder, and the My Work folder is something that is persistent storage. So when you connect to the CSC notebooks and you make changes in the My Work folder, they stay there, and the next time you connect, the changes you made will be preserved. So that's a nice thing. Um, to, to be able to, to benefit from. And that's actually what we're going to do now is we'll go into the My Work folder. So if you uh, just double click on it in the little file navigator thing, uh, you should see that you can go into the My Work folder like this. And then once you have gone into the My Work folder, over on the left side, there's this, I don't know even what you would describe, this kind of like diamond shape or, or uh, side, whatever, rotated square uh, icon. This is the Git plugin, which we'll use more later on in class today. But you can click that, and you'll see there's three options that pop up here saying you know, that you're currently not in a Git repository. What do you want to do? <clears throat> and we want to click the button for clone a repository. So you know, if you click that button, you'll get this prompt, and it says, okay, well, what do you want to clone? And uh, there's instructions about this back on the course webpage, so I'm just going to jump back there for a second. So down below the part where it tells you how to connect and join our workspace, uh, you'll see after launching GeoPython 2022 the first time, you have to do this thing. And I just told you about going to the My Work folder and clicking the Clone Repository button. The address you want to enter is also on that page. And it might be easiest just to copy and paste it from there. Uh, it's just github.com slash geopython slash notebooks dot git. I'm just going to copy that. So again, you can go to the course page and in lesson one in the course environment, you can find this, uh, this address. It's the location of where we keep the, the student copy of the notebooks for the lessons. And uh, once you've copied that, you can go here and paste it into the clone a repo uh, box on on the Jupyter Lab uh, for for GeoPython 2022. <clears throat> Once you have pasted that in there, you should hit the clone button. You'll see this thing pop up saying cloning in the bottom right, and maybe the little spinny thing uh, in the middle of the screen. And then after that, you should see you have now inside my work a directory called Notebooks. Was everyone able to? follow how to do that, got your notebooks. Yeah, okay, got one issue in the back, just a second. Now that you hopefully have uh, the notebooks directory here, if you double click on that folder, you'll see that there's L1 and L2. L1 is obviously from last week's lesson one. L2 is for today, for lesson two, and uh, when we come to it next week, we'll talk about how to pull down the most recent changes so that you would then see lesson three when we start working uh, next week. But for today, you can go into the L2 directory, and inside there, there's a notebook called Python Basic Elements that you can double click to open up. And you should hopefully see something like this. 
So that's where we're going to work for the first part of the lesson for today when we go through some kind of basic bits and basic elements of uh, how to do some things in, in Python. And uh, I think we should be kind of good to go at this, at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to hide this uh, file navigator thing just so that my screen's a little bit easier for you all to see, and, uh, and then we can get started. This environment that we're working in right now for the CSC notebooks is uh, configured so that it has a four hour lifetime. So if we were to stay here for four hours with this open, at uh, some point it will, it will disconnect. It's not that you can sort of have this thing open infinitely, but again, since we've put things inside the My Work directory, any changes that you would have made, if, as long as you have saved anything you've changed in the notebook, uh, would be there. So if your session dies after four hours, uh, don't worry, you can always relaunch a new one and should be able to continue where you left off as long as you saved what you're working on uh, because this is a sort of cloud computing environment and uh, it's, if you don't save things, then they don't, uh, they don't continue to exist. So yeah, let's get into our basic elements of Python stuff for the first half of what we'll cover today. Um, <clears throat> I hope time-wise we don't completely uh, run out of time, but, but we'll see here. And our first, thing, first topic we're going to talk about is uh, about lists and indices. And so a list is a, a data type in Python we have not yet seen, uh, where it allows you to store a collection of values together with a single variable name. And uh, there are several different kinds of these collections. So a collection is kind of a generic name. A list is a type of a collection. It's kind of the simplest type of collection that we can deal with in Python. So what you'll see here is that you have a, uh, a cell under here where it says creating a list. And uh, inside that cell there are some different names. These are names of uh, FMI, so Finnish Meteorological Institute, um, observation stations in the Helsinki area. So these names probably look uh, familiar to you. At the very least, I would assume Kumpula is, uh, is looking familiar. And so for this cell, we're just going to run this to store our list in memory here in Python. So you can again press shift and enter to run the cell and that will store a list of four values here for these four different stations in a variable called station names. Now this is formatted a little bit differently than normally when you type in a list. Uh, it might not format this way. This is um, kind of following some standard for how to format Python code, but just to give you a sense of what this normally would look like. Usually when you type in a list, you have all the values on the same line and things look basically like this. So the way that you indicate you're creating a list is with square brackets. So you would have sort of open square bracket, close square bracket, and everything inside those two would then be uh, values you're putting into your list. And then you would have things separated by commas to indicate each value that's inside the list. So here you can see we have the four names, and after each one of the names, with the exception of the very last one, there's a comma, which indicates you're putting these values into a list uh, when you combine it with the square, square brackets, okay? So uh, we can create our list and print it to the screen. Uh, I guess I want to spell print correctly. So we can print our list called station names to the screen just by using the print function with station names as the variable there. And when you print that out, you see we get back output that looks a lot like what we put in here, which is our text values here in, in single quotes instead of double quotes. Um, that's just how it's output. Uh, but you can also see here the, the sort of brackets that are indicating the values are in, in a list. If you wanted to confirm that further, you can use the type function. So you remember the type function can be used to check what kind of data types you have. Uh, so we could take our variable called station names and use the type function and it will tell us what kind of data type that variable is. And uh, this is indeed a new data type we didn't see last week. So we have this type come back as a list. <coughs> 
So we've got our four station names, and uh, they're all inside our list. And of course, it's a data type list. No surprises there. Now, the way that you deal with things with lists is typically you create a list that has a whole bunch of values in it, or maybe you're going to read in values from a file to a list or something like that. Uh, but, but often when you interact with them, you want to use more than the entire list at once. You typically like to go and get individual values out of your list. And to do that, you use something called an index value. And index value basically is a way to refer to a single um, element or to a, a, a group of elements within a, uh, a list, for example. So if we wanted to print out the first item in our list, we could say station underscore names. So we'll use our print statement again. Then we're going to use square brackets here. And we can give a number inside there. And that's going to refer to which one of the items inside our list we want to, to print out. So you could do print station names, square brackets with a 1 inside, which intuitively you might think would give you the first element in your list. Uh, you can see it's Helsinki Kaizen Yemi. And uh, if we scroll back to our list, that's not actually the first value that's in the list, but rather the second value. And so this has to do with the way in which Python orders things inside a list, and that is that it starts counting from 0 rather than starting counting from 1. Um, there's a lot of programming languages that, that operate the same way, but if you use things like MATLAB in the past, MATLAB starts indexing at 1, Fortran typically starts indexing at 1, but, uh, but many others start indexing at 0. So instead of accessing the first value by typing in print station names and then a 1 in the brackets, we have to put in a 0 there. So, so we can do print station names 0 here. And that will actually give us the first value in our list because we start counting in the list of items with the number 0. So it's uh, becomes kind of second nature when you get used to using it, but just be aware that if you're expecting things to be like the first thing is number one, um, it, it may take a little bit of adjusting to get used to that. But, uh, but that's how you can access single values, basically just by putting inside the square brackets some number. And, uh, and then we have this lovely vending machine example here. Um, I guess I keep making this smaller, but Bill keeps getting bigger, so... Uh, anyway, you can see our vending machine Bill, <coughs> which is our kind of analogy for how to think about these index values and how to kind of relate things that are the items in your list and then the kind of address or the location where you find those items. So, uh, you could imagine being hungry and going to this vending machine, putting in your money, and then you're given the sort of options of like, you know, you can have this nice cheeseburger or a cookie or a lollipop. I don't know how much that's going to do for your hunger. But, um, or, you know, whatever you might like have, you know, from the vending machine. The way in which you actually select which of those items you want to have is by using something that's basically analogous to an index value. It's the location in the vending machine where the item is that you want, that you then want to, uh, to access. So, for instance, to have the cookie you would not push a cookie button over here on the left side, but rather you'd push the number 1, which is going to be the reference to the location in the list of items where, uh, where the cookie could be found. <coughs> so this <coughs> concept between the list and the, event, like the items in the list and how to access them is something that can be a little bit confusing, and if you get um, you know, sort of mixed up between the index value and the, uh, and the items themselves, you can again think about this analogy because uh, I think this is a pretty much spot-on uh, example of how you access values from, from a Python list. Again, it'd be the same thing if we wanted to see the first item in Bill, uh, we would go to index value 0 instead of index value 1 and then it would tell us that there's a cheeseburger there, for example. Or I think there's a kind of uh, example here that if we printed out if we had called our list bill and put all the items in there, the value at, at index number three would be the fourth thing in our list of items, which would be this taco. And so when you print out bill at location three, you would get the word taco back. 
So that's uh, perhaps a useful way to kind of make the connection between the index value and the items in the list themselves. Now, if you want to know how big your list is, this is a pretty typical kind of thing because you can imagine we won't do it this week, but next week we'll be going through how to kind of repeat uh, doing the same kind of steps for, for instance, items inside a list. Maybe you want to go and check each one of the items to see whether it's a taco or whatever. Um, so for the number of items in the list, this is a very common type of thing you want to calculate because you might want to know how many times you have to go through looking to see what the items are. And we can use a function called len for that, which is just a sort of shortened version of the word length, which will tell us the length of our station names list. So we know there's four items in there, and when you run len with station names in it, you should also hopefully see that you get four items back. So again, that's no surprise, but that's a useful thing to know how to, how to calculate. And uh, a couple other things I can sort of say about index values here before we move on to uh, another topic is um, <coughs> if we look in our list, again, we can access values inside uh, the list by putting square brackets in some number like this. If you were to put in the number four there and run this code cell, you're going to get an index error. <coughs> Remember, we have four items inside of our list, but the indexing starts at zero, so the index values will be zero, one, two, three. So if you try to access the value at location index four, it says there is no, nothing there. Uh, there's only four items in the list, and you get basically this error message that says list index out of range, which means that you've tried to access a value that's not uh, within the range of values of uh, the items inside your list. So again, this is just something to be aware of that you might be tempted to say like, oh, I want to get the last value in my list. I'm going to use the len function, which will tell me how long my list is, and I can put that in here in place of the index value, but of course that's not going to work. So uh, it turns out there are um, easier ways to do this. So you could say, you know, len station names minus one. That's pretty clumsy. Uh, if you want to get the last value in one of your lists, the easy way to do it in Python is that you can actually use negative numbers to use index values going backwards from the bottom of the list. So if you put in station names minus one, it will take the last value in the list and show you Helsinki Kumpula, which you might remember is the last value that we had in our list before. And, uh, and you can kind of keep going backwards from there if you want. So you could go to you know, minus two, minus three, and you'd just be kind of going back up the list from, from the end. Um, <coughs> so you know, we could print out negative, you know, larger negative numbers here, like station names minus four. So with this, we're starting at minus one as the last value in the list. So if you go minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, it should give us the first value from our list, but counting backwards from the, from the end of it. And uh, so, you know, we can, we can do things like, um, like that to go backwards. I'm gonna maybe skip over this cell, but of course here you could also do something like um, <coughs> the station names minus five, and you can still give yourself an index error because you can also count from the back of the list up to the point where you go beyond the first value, trying to go backwards, and still you'll get this list index out of range because now you're trying to access something that would effectively not be part of your list. So it doesn't loop around, it just, you can go backwards uh, until you reach the, the total number of items in the list, and then of course you can index error if you try to keep going backwards after that. So, that's a little bit about Python lists and index values, and now we have a poll question, and uh, maybe it just take me a second to make this visible. 
but you should hopefully be able to see this now if you go to the poll page. So again, it's geopython.github.io slash poll. And uh, we have a list here of cute animals. So bunny, chick, duckling, kitten, and puppy. It's not a sort of uh, comprehensive list, but I think these are probably some of the top five cute animals. And uh, the question for you here to vote on <coughs> is which animal is at index minus two? So think about it for a second, add your vote, and uh, we'll continue in just a moment. All right, so we have 40 votes for kitten. So uh, this is, you know, sort of not entirely rigged, but I think probably on the internet, if you ask the question, you know, what's, what's the first cute animal that comes to mind? Kitten's probably number one. So of course, we're gonna choose an example where we get a value of kitten. And yes, as we go through a list of cute animals like this, if we go backwards with a negative index value, index minus one would be puppy and index minus two would indeed be kitten. So um, yeah, that's of course a little bit of a silly example, but that's basically how you can think about trying to access values in your Python list. And there are cases where uh, sometimes you want to go forward through items in your list, accessing them, starting at index zero, then one, two, and so on. Uh, but being able to go backwards through a list is actually a pretty useful thing to do in Python as well. So um, that's perhaps a handy thing to, to know about. <clears throat> so yes, let's, uh, let's deal with a couple other things related to our Python lists. And uh, the next thing for us to perhaps consider here <coughs> would be modifying the values inside a list. So we've seen an example of how to create a list. We've seen an example of how to access items in a list. But let's try to uh, now modify a value inside a list. And again, here we have a code cell that already has some stuff in it, just so you don't have to type it in. But you can press Shift and Enter. And now we have these station types. So we had our four uh, meteorological stations we had previously, and each one currently in our station types list would be listed as a weather station. But uh, you could imagine that we have a mistake in here and we want to correct this. So if we take our station type for station number three, which is at index number two, uh, we could change it to be a Mario graph instead of a weather station. And the way to do this is actually fairly intuitive, I would say. So you take your station types list, the index where you want to make your change, in this case is index two, and then we're gonna say the value there is equal to Mario graph, Mario graphs, like that. So your station types, index number two, and then you set the value that you want that to be equal to, and if you run that cell, and then maybe let's just go ahead and print out station types after that so we can see what we've changed. If you run this, you should then see weather stations, weather stations, Mario graphs, weather stations. So a couple things to be careful with with this, of course, is that you do need to include the index value here. If you leave that off, you will basically just replace your list with a string uh, or a character string called Mario graphs that would then yeah, blow away your list. Um, because if you leave the index value out, it's essentially like reassigning a variable and, uh, and your Python <laughs> list will go away when you do that. So just be aware. <coughs> um, we've got a few more cells that we can run here in, uh, in another example. So our examples so far have all been like lists of different character strings. In, uh, in a Python list, but let's go ahead and run these. Uh, I guess we've got five cells that you can run here. So this is gonna assign a variable called station name, station ID, station lat, station lon, and station type. So these are <coughs> some of our different uh, things that might relate to a single station. So rather than having a list of all the different station types, we could have also a case where we have a uh, single station, like I guess this is Caibo Puisto, and um, our station 
information here is these five different things, and we can actually put these into a list called health or station hell kaibo, uh, which is obviously just abbreviated. Then we've got square brackets, which indicates we're creating a list, and inside here we have the variables that we just stored. So station name, station ID, lat, lon, and station type. So if you run this cell, we now create a list that has different data types in it than we had before. So we have some character strings like the station name, but then the station ID is all integer numbers, a so whole, whole uh, number of values. So that's an integer. And then we have here two other numbers that have a decimal point. So those would be floating point numbers and then another character string. And of course, we can use the type function to check this. If we were to, for instance, do type for station hell kaibo. And then uh, if we took the first value inside that list at index zero, and we were to run this cell, it comes back saying it's str, so character string, just as you'd expect. Uh, that's our character string right there. So you can see the quotation marks around it, which is a dead giveaway that it's a character string. But uh, if I copy this and paste it down to the cell below and look at the second item in the list, that's our station ID, and that comes back as being a type int. And uh, similarly, if we were to look at the third item in the list, it comes back as type float because that is our, uh, that should be latitude, I guess, for the uh, Helsinki Kaipo Puisto station. So 60.15 degrees north latitude makes sense there. And just as a reminder for the entire list itself, if we look at the type of the list without an index value that's given there, of course, station hell kaibo, that variable is of type list. So <clears throat> one of the nice things about a Python list is the fact that you can have other variable types inside of your list. It doesn't have to all be numbers. It doesn't have to all be character strings. Uh, it could be other lists. It could be other kind of uh, data structures in there. You could put you know, if you wanted to, a uh, data type that rep represents a plot into a Python list like this. So it's a very flexible um, structure in the sense that you can basically put anything that you would like into it and you can modify the things that are there pretty easily as we've, as we've seen. <coughs> so that's, yeah, a little bit about... Um, how to modify values that are in place and, and the different kinds of things that can be stored in lists. But another thing you may want to do is to actually add values to your list or to remove values from, uh, from your list. So if we take a look here at the station names that we had back at the beginning, um, you can just type in station names and run the code cell there and you'll, you'll see our four station names we started working with when we were dealing with Python lists at the beginning. So uh, we have those here. If you want to remove a value from the list, there is a, uh, a del statement that can be used. So of course, this is just short for delete. So if you were to del the first value that's in here, so station underscore names at index zero, <coughs> that's going to basically drop the first value from our list. So we expect this Helsinki Harmaria to disappear uh, by running this cell. Let's see if we run it. And then let's print out station names again. You don't actually have to type print, but you can just type the variable name and hit uh, shift enter. And you'll now see that we have Kaisen, Yemi, Kaipo, Puisto, and Kumpula still here, and we've lost our first value. So del can be used to basically delete uh, values out of a list, and in this case, we're doing it on the basis of the index value, which is pretty typical um, for for how you do that. There are other ways you can you can delete things, but uh, but this is a pretty typical way to to do that. Another possibility would be that if we wanted to add values to our list, 
And uh, there's a couple different ways that you could do this, but let's imagine we have a couple um, additional stations we'd like to add here. So Helsinki Lighthouse and Helsinki Malmi Airfield. Um, we can add those by using a uh, what's called a method for uh, a data type that is a list. So we have our station names list. And if we said station names dot append, and then we put in parentheses something we want to add to our list. Append is just a sort of fancy word for add. Um, <coughs> we're going to add, for instance, Helsinki Lighthouse. You can copy paste that if you want. Um, so we can do that. And uh, we could also do the same. I guess I'll run this one first. And uh, if we then did station names dot append, we had also Helsinki Malmi Airfield as a station we could add. And maybe after this one, I'll go ahead and print out station names just so that you can see the modified contents of our list. So dot append allows us to add items to to the list, and then if we run this and print it out, we can see that we have our original three out of the four, and then Helsinki Lighthouse and Helsinki Malmi Airfield. Um, <coughs> so I think it's also possible, if I'm not mistaken, to append values other ways to, to lists. Um, you can actually add lists together. Uh, so there are, <coughs> there are ways to do this other than using the dot append function. Again, lists are pretty, pretty flexible. So uh, I don't really feel like I should be taking time to do this, but just as an example, um, you know, if we had some list here of, uh, well, let's go back to our cute animals, whatever. Um, so if we had some list one of cute animals here and list two of cute animals, and this is just uh, puppy and uh, I don't know what else was in the original list. Um, how about, uh, let's go with, I don't know. Um, Let's add one that doesn't belong there. So we'll put a snake. Maybe some people think snakes are cute. So we could make these two lists like this, list one and list two. And uh, if we were to do create list three equals list one plus list two and then print out list three. This is another way in which you can combine things in Python lists. You can basically just add them together. So if you add two lists together, it sort of just appends them in the order in which you list things. Um, I just show you this because I think rather than using dot append, this is the way I would typically do things. It's just, it makes more sense to me to just add them together with a plus than, uh, than using append. Uh, I find the kind of append, it's, I, I mean, it makes sense, but it's, uh, I, I think, to me, this is easier to understand what's going on than using dot append. So, um, just showing you as an example that, as you'll see in Python, we try to show you the sort of good way or the typical way in which you would do things, but there's often other solutions as well. And uh, this is just one, one example of an alternative way in which you could add things to lists or add lists together, for example. So um, there's a little warning here about appending to an integer, not so fast. Uh, dot append is something that really depends on the data type that you are, are using. So like when you have a list, you can append things to a list. It makes sense. You have a group of, of items. You can add something to the end of that. But um, <coughs> You know, if we had a variable, well, 
I think I'm going to maybe diverge a little bit from what's done on the course page. We have this station ID variable that here is 132310. And if we try to append to the station ID, you know, some other number, doesn't matter what you put in here, uh, station ID is an integer data type. So if we check the type of station ID that we defined earlier, you can see it's an integer, and the integers don't support append as something you can do to an integer. It's, it basically uh, tells you it has no attribute called append. It has no way for you to append something to an integer. It kind of doesn't make any logical sense for what you're trying to do. For a list, it makes sense because, again, you're adding something to your list, but for a single number, append, it's not clear uh, what you're actually trying to do, and you'll get an attribute error telling you that you basically can't use dot append with a number. It's, uh, it's not supported. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that example is there, and you can, you can take a look on the course webpage. It shows you the example of, of how it's actually supposed to have been uh, been presented, but I kind of want to get through the rest of uh, of what we have to say here about lists and and uh, some of the other list methods, um, so that we can get a, a break in before we move to our next topic. So um, there's some other things that are kind of useful here, like uh, list methods like dot count. So if we have our station names list. I'm just going to run this real quick so you can remember what's in here. We've got these five different stations. And uh, if we were to do station names dot count, what you can do is basically look for the number of occurrences of something inside the list station name. So we could put in Helsinki Kumpula and see how many times the string Helsinki Kumpula appears inside of our list station names. And when I run this, I see it is in there one time, which makes sense. That's kind of what we would expect to see. Um, <clears throat> note that if you run this just as, uh, as Helsinki, it comes back saying zero times, which might surprise you a little bit. Um, I'll just maybe show what the station names list looks like, because you see the string Helsinki in here five times, and you might be kind of wondering why it comes back saying zero. But what it's looking for is a string that is exactly this. So exactly Helsinki with nothing else after it. So none of these strings are exactly that because each of them has some other location that's listed after that. So, um, so it is specific and, and looking for exactly that character string, which is the reason why it, uh, it doesn't come back with the number five, for example, in, in this case. Um, you can also use list name dot index, so station names dot index, um, which will tell you the <coughs> tell you the index or the location of a given value inside your list. So again, if we use Helsinki Kumpolo here, it will give us the index value where this item occurs inside. The list. And so you can see here it's at index number two. Here's our list. So index zero, one, two, sure enough, that's Helsinki Kumpula. Um, I don't use these that frequently personally, but of course it's uh, useful to do things like dot count. For instance, if you have a really long list and you want to know whether there is a certain string in there at all, then dot count can be useful for uh, finding, rather than having to kind of print out the entire list or do something else, you can quickly check and see, like, does this value occur in the list anywhere? Um, so, yeah, and the dot index, of course, once you know where a value is, it, it might be faster to figure out what the index is but using dot index rather than trying to count or something like that. So there's a couple other things here. So there's station names, dot reverse, which you can imagine what that one does, reverses your list. Um, so if you run that and then we print out our station names, I'll just type it in here and run it. Now it starts with Malmi Airfield and ends with 
in Kaizen Gaming, and yes, of course, it works. One thing to be aware of with this, and this is the warning for you, is uh, this station names dot reverse method operates on the list and modifies the list just by running dot reverse. You don't need to assign this as like station names equals station names dot reverse. This is a little bit confusing and I'm specifically warning you because when you run this, <coughs> uh, if I was to print out station names dot reverse, I don't actually get my list backwards. Instead, I get none, which might seem a little bit confusing, but this operation returns a value of none. So if you say station names equals station names dot reverse, your list will now be equal to none. So um, just something to be aware of. The station names dot reverse method essentially will reverse the values in the list, but you don't need to assign it. In fact, you shouldn't because you'll delete your list uh, by doing that. So uh, I ran station names dot reverse again, so my list got reversed a second time, so now it's back in the back in the original order. So there's a warning about this on the course page. There's a warning here in the notebook. Please just pay attention. We won't have you using dot reverse heavily, but uh, of course it's very disappointing when you have been working for a while, sort of cleaning up your list and making things nice and pretty, and then you accidentally delete it at the very end when you try to reverse the list. Uh, dot sort actually works the same way. So uh, dot sort will will sort the items in the list alphabetically or numerically. So if we were to take uh, station names dot sort and run that and then print out what we have, this should change the order of things. Uh, I probably did not because I think they're already in alphabetical order here. So let's uh, let's reverse our list again. So. Okay, now it's in reverse order, and uh, if I do dot sort and print it again here, dot sort will alphabetize things. So it's going to look here, all these strings all start with Helsinki, and then it's going to then take here and put things in alphabetical order. So K comes before M, makes sense. M doesn't come before L, which might seem a little weird, but in, uh, in sorting letters in Python and many other programming languages, capital letters come before lowercase. So things will be in alphabetical order, capital first, and then lowercase letters after that. So just be, uh, be aware. It might seem a little bit weird the way that, uh, that those things are working. Um, <coughs> we have a little bit more here about other data types, but I think we're also probably in need of a break. So why don't we take 10 minutes and, uh, and let's come back. We'll, we'll continue with like the last couple things we have to talk about with, uh, with our Python basic elements and then we'll go into talking about version control. But, but uh, let's do all that in, in 10 minutes or so.